There's a, a lot of opinions, if, that, if I can put it that way, when it comes to fasting and prayer. And you would think that in Christendom, that there would be this collective celebration that would take place overall about the fact that there are those who feel the necessity or want to undertake this, uh, this discipline of fasting. You would think that there would be excitement. I'm just looking to see where the excitement is. Woo, four people. That's going to be powerful. You would think that there would be this excitement and a collective joy that there are people that have come to understand uh, the value of and the impact and the necessity of fasting. And by the way, when I say fasting, it's always coupled with prayer. Um, if you fast and don't pray, it's a diet or a hunger strike. But it's, it's always coupled with prayer. I mean, it, it serves no purpose for any person to sit in their room with the door closed and not eat for 21 days. It, it just doesn't work that way. So I just want to say this up front. If you hear me refer to fasting, for the sake of time and less words, which it's a futile exercise, it's always coupled with prayer. Amen? Amen. Now, again, you would think that there would be this excitement, but the reaction of some Christians are quite shocking, well, let alone the world. The world will say, well, you're nuts. But when it comes to Christians, some of their reactions are shocking. You have those that come out and try to discourage you. Why would you do that for? What, are you crazy? Aren't you living in the right times? Aren't you living in the new covenant? You don't have to do that kind of stuff. You have those that try to discourage you from partaking in a fast by bashing you. You think that you can add to the complete and perfect work of Christ Jesus? Who do you think you are? And you get some of those. And you have those who try to um, bring out the holiness card and say, well, who do you think you are? Do you think you're holier than thou? Um, But I don't think that there's such thing as being too holy. You know, when someone says, are you, you're, you're, you're too holy or you're trying to be too holy, I don't think there is such a thing. I don't think you can try hard enough. I don't think there's any effort that should be spared when it comes to holiness. But you have those types of critiques that come across. Some think that fasting is a form of asceticism or self-punishment. And I can assure you, We're not punishing ourselves. People think that we punish our bodies in order to gain favor with God. And that's not at all. The irony is that when it comes to the opposite of fasting, like gluttony, it's celebrated. I mean, if we announced that we were having a hot dog eating contest in our youth group, and whoever can eat the most hot dogs and all this stuff, you'd have people cheering, like, yeah, ah, amazing. And it just shocks me because that is actually not good. That's actually sinful behavior. It's a celebration of decadence. It's, a, it's hurting your body in a different way. But I want to set the record straight this morning because obviously I'm going to be talking about the fast that counts. Number one, we're not crazy. Number two, we are certainly not adding or taking away anything from the finished work of Christ by fasting. We're not adding to salvation. We're not getting more saved. You can't be more saved than you already are. Either you're saved or you're not. We are not more holy than others, but we would like to be. And sometimes denying the flesh helps that process. And we're not punishing ourselves. To go without voluntarily shows that our spirit is more in control than our flesh. You know, over the years in fasting, I've come to the conclusion that not everyone will support the effort. And I wish I could say it's only outside of the church. No. In a sense, fasting is not a team sport. But it's something that is driven by one's convictions based on scriptural understanding. There are those who do not see the necessity in fasting, and I wish them well. Then there are those who are completely legalistic about it, driven more by form than by purpose. 
But I believe that fasting is, a ne is necessary for the advancement of the kingdom and the part that you play in the kingdom. I believe that fasting plays a key role in demonstrating for yourself that your spirit isn't as weak as you think it is. And that you're not controlled by the desires of the flesh, but you are driven by the desires of the spirit and the things of God. I believe that fasting brings clarity and causes you to focus more on the spiritual reality of your life than, the, than you normally would, that you would normally spend time thinking about some of the realities of the spiritual side of your life. But I'll tell you why I see the necessity to fast. And we'll probably talk about it at length at another time, but it's a very simple reason. If you ask yourself, why... If you were to ask me, okay, I'll use myself as the guinea pig, and maybe you can apply it yourself. Pastor, why do you fast? Why do you think it's necessary to fast? And the simple answer, two words, Jesus fasted. There's a whole theology there. There's a whole doctrine that can be built around that. You know, in the New Testament, there are only two references to Jesus fasting, And they both deal with the same event. So it's mentioned twice, but it's referring to the same time. You'll find them both in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, where he spent 40 days in the wilderness. And while he spent those 40 days in the wilderness, he just didn't walk around in the, in the wilderness, but he fasted for those 40 days. And I'm also certain that Jesus, being a Jew, also fasted as the prescribed, at the prescribed times of, the, of Judaism as well. Like, for instance, on the Day of Atonement, they were to fast. I'm pretty sure, even without mention, Jesus being an exemplary Jew, fasted when it was time to fast. But I'll touch on that matter at another time. But in a nutshell, if the Son of God incarnate, you hear me, the Son of God incarnate, felt that it was necessary to fast, then as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, I will fast too. Amen. If it was beneficial for the Son of God incarnate, well, then you better believe that it's beneficial for you and I. So if it's for my own spiritual growth and development so that I can be an effective Christian in this world, then you know what? The bottom line is sign me up. On a personal and experiential level, I can attest to the benefits and the results of fasting and prayer. You know, it's been 13 years since I took the, 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 the pastorate of this church. And I've been ministering at this church for those 13 years. And we've made it a priority as a people, as a church, as a community to fast and to pray regularly. And because of that, because we fasted and we prayed, we've experienced all together By the way, the results of that time of fasting and prayer. For one, we're freely standing in this location in St. Leonard, which according to the world at the time was off limits. This was not supposed to happen, according to people. We are here in this room, which you know what you think that is, is about spending money and about making a nice room. No, no, no. You have to understand this, that when we first wanted to move here, that this room was the point of contention, that we were not allowed to have a place to gather that had more than 100 seats in it. And look where we're sitting now. When we were told that we would never have a permit, when we were told, as long as I'm here, you will never have a permit for that building, Because of our times of consecration and fasting and prayer, not only do we have the permit, we have the proper permit and no one can take it away from us. The church has grown in number. Why? Because we fasted and we prayed. We made it part of our goal to be connected to what God desires, and that's for people to come to the saving knowledge of Christ, and that's happened. Hundreds have been saved in this building. Hundreds have been baptized during that time. And that's because we fasted and we prayed. We have a vision And we have strength to move forward. Why? 
because of the times that we've spent fasting and praying and allowing God to reveal his plan to us. We are under no financial pressure from outside sources. I'm going to tell you this one. Um, when I first announced that we were going to do whatever we are going to do, and we as a body are going to pay for it ourselves, people almost passed out. Because it's unheard of as a church in the modern era to do anything without debt. We have not given one cent after that declaration to any bank or financial institution. We have not spent time making the world richer and the church poorer. As a matter of fact, we've been able to do all the things we've done, even financially. Why? Well, number one, because people gave faithfully, and the church has given faithfully, and, you know, and this ties in with Pastor, with Pastor Lisa. I believe we got God's attention in our giving. But not only that, we fasted and we prayed. And God opened those types of doors. And here we are now, and we're getting ready to fast and pray again, where people would say, why? We've reached the promised land. If you think this is the promised land, my friends, you're sadly mistaken. We are here now, but our fasting and our prayer now, what we are going to enter into in the next couple of hours will propel us into a greater future than it like it did in the past and I can attribute all those things to fasting and prayer by the way this is a testimony of God's grace and this is a testimony of God's goodness to this church corporately and some of you are saying yeah but you know what what about me the same principles work individually So this is what I want to tell you as we get ready for this corporate fast. Yes, we are fasting together as a community, as the body of Christ, because we want to see great advancements in the body of Christ for the kingdom. We want to advance. And we are going to see those prayers answered. God will hear from heaven. I have total confidence in him because we're not changing plans. We're not changing course. We understand that our source is God. We understand that we can do nothing apart from him, and we're going to continue to do that. Now, for you personally, when you engage in this exercise or discipline, whatever you want to call it, of fasting and prayer, what God is able to do for the corporate body, he'll do for you individually. I didn't even mention, by the way, the non-spiritual benefits of fasting. You know, you know, I don't know about you guys. I've been studying a lot on fasting from the medical perspective or from the scientific end of things. First and foremost, the spiritual benefits are unparalleled. But did you know what it does for your body? And uh, you know what? I would encourage you, not just for the body, because my wife, I wish you guys were here on Friday night. My wife talked about fasting and prayer She, like, knocked it out of the park. I learned a lot of things. I'm excited to fast and pray. Um, But you need to understand this. If you're going to fast and pray because you think you're going to shed the 15 pounds you put on during Christmas and New Year, don't do it. You will balloon past that 15 pounds, no problem, at the end of the fast. But there are benefits to do it all around. You know, God, this wasn't by accident. God didn't say, you know what, I have an idea. I'm going to... Tell people to fast, and it's not going to have any kind of other implication other other than spiritual. No, when you follow what God does, I come to find out that it benefits you spiritually, and it benefits you physically. Amen? But there's this misconception that we fast to try and twist God's arm. How many of you have ever heard people say that? That we can fast so that we can get God to do our bidding. And I, I want to correct that thinking, and I want to even correct that type of critique, because number one, God doesn't change. Number two, you can't make God do anything. I don't know what's going on. Is it the snow? Are you guys really sad about the snow today? Because if the snow is really having that type of effect, you really need to be part of this fast and prayer. God may heal you. Number one, God doesn't change his mind. Number two, you can't make God do anything. And number three, if we are truly in tune with God, his bidding becomes our bidding. So just to set the record straight, 
take note of this. Fasting is not making God do what he doesn't want to do. It's showing God that we are serious about what he wants to do and that we're ready to do it. I'm going to repeat that one more time because I think this is imp- should be impactful for you. Fasting is not making God do what he doesn't want to do. It's showing God that we are serious about what he wants to do and that we're ready to do it. I think we need to really understand that because it'll give you a whole new focus and understanding about fasting and why we do it. How many of you are serious about doing what God wants to do? Are you serious about what God wants to do? Are you ready to do what God wants you to do? Well, then we got to show them. One thing that I never want fasting, and don't worry, I have scripture. We're going to talk about scripture at length. You know what? I know. I know what time it is. I also saw people come in here a little bit late. <laughs> Half hour late. So I'm going to take my time. The ones that came early, I know you don't want to go. We'll stay. <laughs> One thing that I never want our fasting time to become is a gimmick. And that we rally around at the head of the year and say, <clears throat> listen, you know what? We're going to fast because it's what we do. If it's something that makes, or me, it makes you feel connected or to be part of the community, if it's something that you've become used to doing, I'm going to say a lot of this today. Please do yourself a favor and don't fast. Because if fasting became something for you that's just wanting to connect you to the community so you could feel part of something, you don't need to do that. We love you. We accept you. You're part of the family anyway. But fasting and prayer is for those who are done with the status quo. Fasting and prayer is for those who want to do more and who want to be used by God for more. Attitude, by the way, is everything. I wish you were here again on Friday night when my wife was, was talking about She did a masterful job. I can't say it. I'm winning all kinds of brownie points today. My wife did a masterful job on talking about fasting and prayer. I would encourage you to watch the replay because there's a lot in there if you're serious about the fast. But one of the things that she said about fasting, which again is always coupled with prayer, is that it's not a religious ritual. It's not something that we do to meet an obligation. It's not something that we do to check off the list and say, look, we did it, and you know what? We we fulfilled our obligation, and so now we can move on to bigger and better things. Much about the new covenant that we have in Christ Jesus is that we've been freed from the rigors of religious ritual, and our actions have become voluntary based on the only obligation that we have as believers, which is Love. Why do we fast? Not because we're forced to fast. Not because pastors said we have to fast. Not because the Bible, it just tells us if we have, to, we have to fast as a religious exercise. No. We do it because we love the God that we serve. And we want to demonstrate that love even in our fasting. And the motive and the attitude behind whatever we do, whether it's fasting or anything else, must always be what? Love. And therefore, our actions must demonstrate our devotion and our love towards God. And I, that's what I believe that the Old Testament alluded to when we read certain chapters of it. You know, when you read the Old Testament, you realize that the people had the law. And they, they, they followed the law to a T. They made sure that they were so religious about crossing every T and dotting every I, if you will, that they made sure that they fulfilled the obligation to the set of rules that was presented to them. They were involved in all the form. But at a certain point, it became that it was all about form, and their hearts remained unchanged. As a matter of fact, their hearts were really far from God who was supposed to be the central part of their worship. You know, God brings something against the people of Israel at a certain point. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 58, and now we'll get into the text, and we'll talk about it together. And there are certain lessons that we can gain and learn from them. We're going to go through the chapter, 
and we'll read it together as we go through, and we'll make some comments. But at a certain point in time, we get to this prophet by the name of Isaiah. How many of you know the prophet Isaiah? Isaiah lived 150 years before the people, prophesied 150 years before the people of Israel went into exile into Babylon. You know what the whole purpose of Isaiah's ministry was? It was to warn the people. He was the prophet that went out and tried to tell them the message that God wanted the wanted his people to, that, that God wanted for his people to hear. And his whole purpose was to get them to repent, to turn from the direction that they were going, because they were going down this slippery slope. And one of the things I love about God, one of the many, 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 many things I love about God is that he's very patient. God just never does something like that. He never just acts out in anger. He's not me. He's not you that just reacts to something. When God sees that there's something that needs to be addressed or corrected, he will give ample time for you to repent before his patience comes to an end. You hear me? Because there are people just like the people of Israel who thought that God's patience never comes to an end. No, but it does. And so God speaks to the prophet Isaiah, and he says, listen, Isaiah, this is what I want you to tell the people. Enough's enough. There's something that's going on here. We have people that honor me with their lips, but their hearts are way far from me. We have people that are so steeped in religious obligation and fulfilling the religious duties and, and, and living by the, the, the letter of the law that they have no love for me anymore. They like to be associated with me from a distance, but they don't love me. And that's pretty much what he says. That's why I asked you to turn to Isaiah 58, because it talks about the type of fast that God wants, which I've entitled the message for today, the fast that counts. Because how many of you want to go into this fast and have absolutely nothing happen? I don't even know who here is fasting, who's not fasting. If you're not fasting, you wouldn't admit it anyway. Don't admit it. Don't say I'm fasting and then don't do it because that's not a good thing. But how many of you want to go into the fast and say, you know what, I'm going to go into this fast. I'm going to do 21 days, but I have no expectation of anything happening. Well, if you do it the wrong way, nothing will happen. And that's why it's important to get things straight so that you will participate in a fast that will be very effective, very impactful, and that will yield great fruit. Let's go through Isaiah 58 together. These are the words of God. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sin. Again, this is God speaking to Isaiah. And his job is to tell the people what God wants them to hear. And at this particular case, God wanted him to proclaim in a loud voice. I want you to point out their sins. These are people that prided themselves on the fact that they were the chosen people of God. They prided themselves around the fact that they were the only monotheistic religion around. They prided themselves on the fact that they had such a rich heritage of God demonstrating and showing his power in their, uh, for them throughout the history, from the time that they came out of slavery to the time they went into the land that they were currently occupying by that point, to God showing how powerful he was with all the conquests, with all the battles they went through, God showing miraculous signs and wonders over and over again. These people prided themselves on who their God was, but they had become so proud to the point that their piety had really just become hypocrisy. But here's the charge in verse 2. Yet they act so pious. This is their sin. They act so pious. They act so holy. They come to the temple every day. And they seem delighted. To learn about me. They seem delighted. You, you know what impacted me about reading those verses the other day? That even, I'll apply it to us in the modern day, that God knows our heart. Just like he was able to point, they seem to come to the temple delighted, but they're not. 
God knows our hearts. God knows why we do the things we do and with what attitude we do them. God knows if we're really in love with him and love him, or he also knows if we're just going through the motions. They act like a religious nation. They would never abandon the laws of God. Why? Because within the laws of God, there's security. It gave a framework for how to live. They ask me to take actions on their behalf, meanwhile, pretending that they want to be near me. They say, we fasted before you, verse 3. Why aren't you impressed? Why have we been, we've been so very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it? Let me ask you a question. Is fasting something that we do to impress God? No. I'm going to say this and it's going to sound very down, but you guys are already in a down mood, so it doesn't matter. I don't think you can really impress God all that much. And I'm careful how I say that. I, I, I don't think. Oh, that's incredible. I don't, I don't think God stands in that. I know that you can get God's attention. We heard that. But I don't think God's all that impressed. Especially when you have an attitude like these people had. They said, look what I've done for you, God. is the attitude that they had behind the type of worship and behind the fast that they were, 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 were performing. Is this type of fast that looks right on the outside, but on the inside it carries all the wrong motives. It's a fast that is concentrating on the form, but lacks in substance. And this is the exact reason why it doesn't garner the proper attention that they're looking for. You keep on reading, it says, I'll tell you why. This is what God says. He goes, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm not impressed. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why you haven't gotten my attention. I'll tell you why. Because you're fasting to please yourself. You know, if I were to ask anyone in this room, if you're going to fast, like the, the, the notion of it pleasing you. I mean, you know, I was talking to someone this morning and we were in the office and we were chatting and, and, uh, and they said to me, I'm not looking forward to the fast. I mean, understand how I'm saying that. And they're saying it in the flesh. And I understand that. I comprehend that. In the flesh. Who in their flesh is looking forward to a fast? I mean, as soon as I say the word fast, you think burger. <laughs> Steak. You, like, I say fast, you say burger. That's how the flesh reacts. Some of you are even not even listening to anything I'm saying. All you're thinking about is the last meal. Some of you even set your table like that at home. You put an extra long table. You invited 11 of your closest friends. And you're all going to sit on one side, eat your last meal, and have a photograph taken of yourself. As if you're walking to the crucifixion. It's a fast for heaven's sakes. I've never thought of fasting for pleasing myself, but... It gets God's attention. When your motives are wrong, when your motives are self-serving, it gets God's attention, but the negative kind of attention, not the positive kind. It's the type of fast that's egocentric, meaning that it's you-centered, and not theocentric, meaning God-centered. God's looking for those that will fast, that will have him in mind, and have him at the center of their thoughts. The type of fast that pleases yourself is the type of fast that satisfies your religious duty, but your heart is far from God, and he's not even in your consideration. Look at verse, uh, con the continuation of verse 3 and on. It's, it's, it's even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think that this will please the Lord? What's the main problem here? That was a rhetorical question. Don't answer 
There's no change. This hit me hard, personally. Um, because I remember fasting, and what would happen is during the times of fasting, whether it was a week or 21 days or three days or whatever it was, uh, I would lose my temper. How many of you have ever lost your temper during a fast? Oh, you're all the best. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get cranky, get upset. It bothered me because there were times during the fast, even you can ask my wife, she'd be more than happy to tell you where um, she would say something and I would snap at her and I'd say, I'm fasting. <laughs> <laughs> that loud. Where I couldn't be bothered. It was like, I'm so concentrated on just doing the fast that you know what? I'm not mindful of my behavior. I'm not mindful of what I do. And you know what? I come to realize that that cancels out the fast. Because that's exactly what he's saying here. There's no change. I'm going to tell you what the primary goal of fasting is. And some of you are going to be shocked by what I'm going to say. But the primary goal of fasting is change. The primary result of a fast is not the, just the changing of the situations around you or changing of the situations that you find yourself in, although that is going to happen if you're doing it right. But the primary focus of fasting is not changing the people around you. It's about changing you. That's why people don't fast. And that's why people don't do it properly. Because if you do it properly, and if you do it at all, there is going to be a change that's going to take place in your life. And it's not just a physical, outward, gaunt appearance that you will show after about 10 days of going without food. You know, I've come to understand that the reason why there's such a spiritual pushback against fasting is because I think, I believe that people's flesh knows that if I engage in fasting, that I'm going to be changed and I like the way I am. <laughs> we can wrongly approach a fast with the idea that if we do it, We'll get what we want. What you should want first in a fast is to be changed. Now listen, we gave out this list of 21 prayer points. 21 prayer points a day for 21 days. The same prayer points. Pray them over and over again. Because why? Because we believe that when we pray, when we fast, that things change. Situations change. For instance salvations and revival in all ages. We pray for church ministries. We pray for the pastors and the leaders. Please pray for the pastor and the leaders. Pray for the senior pastor because the junior pastors are... Anyway. <laughs> we pray that God would raise up ministers for the gospel of Canada. We pray for expansion. We pray for new church plan. We pray for Vancouver, the church in Vancouver. We pray for spiritual awakening in the nation. We pray for Canadian pastors and churches against the evil agenda. We pray against, we pray for, not against, we pray for justice and freedom. We, we, we pray and ask the Lord, anoint me with fresh oil. And see, this is the part that I'm interested in right now. Anoint me with fresh oil. Empower me to be fruitful. Direct my steps. Have your way in my family. Thank you for divine health throughout 2024. Thank you for the salvation of so on and so forth and whatever else you want to add to the list. When you pray and fast, you must pray and fast that the Lord indelibly change you. Because sometimes we could get so caught up in everything else around us, but why answer that prayer if we remain unchanged? Don't you understand in order for you and I to receive the greater things that God has in store, that we can't receive them in the present condition and situation that we find ourselves? That if we want to go to different places with God, there has to be a, 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 a process. There has to be this perpetual change that takes place in our lives. And that's one of the things that fasting does. We wouldn't be able to handle what God has in store if we remained who we were last year. Essentially saying, listen carefully, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. You can't put 
What God has for tomorrow in yesterday's storehouse. You have to be ready for tomorrow. You have to be prepared for tomorrow. You have to be changed for tomorrow. You cannot remain. What happens, by the way, for those of you that listen to that, you can't put new wine, old wine, and new wineskins. Sorry, new wine and old wineskins. What happens? Do you guys even know, understand wineskins? I never had, a, well, my uncle had a wineskin. He had it hanging there. We tried drinking out of it. It, it was a fake wineskin. It, it tasted of rubber. It was just covered in leather. And what happens when you would take a, 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 an old wineskin and put new wine in it? You put the new wine, the new wine begins to ferment. It makes bubbles. It expands. What happens to the old wineskin? Poop. It explodes and you get wine all over the place. What God is doing to us in a fast is he's making us a container that's able to contain what's coming next. We need to be changed first. And then the changes come along around us. You know what people have? People have this, this fast and carry on approach. I remember when that was a big thing. Be calm and carry on. Remember that? How many of you have the t-shirt still? You're dating yourself. Well, that's what people have when it comes to fasting. Fast and carry on. We're going to fast. We'll do it. But we're just going to keep on going in the same way, the same direction. No change. No nothing. But I'm telling you what. It's painful. We fulfill our religious obligations. So let's keep things the way they are. Let's just keep moving forward the way they are. I did what I had to do. Now God better do. Now God better be impressed. And he better do his part, and he better take notice of me. My concern is that people could go through all the motions. You can do a 21-day fast. You can do the most extreme fast and everything. But at the end of it all, you remain the same. If you have no intention of being changed, I'm warning you now because we're going to start in a few hours. If you have no intention of being changed... If you want to remain the same, please do yourself a favor and do not fast. Because all you're doing is dieting. If you have no desire for a heart change that leads to behavior change. You know, I talk to a ton of people. They say, I have a temper problem. I have a jealousy problem. I have bitterness in my heart. I have unforgiveness in my heart. I, I have trouble dealing with such and such a person. I've been hurt too many times. I've been this and this and that. And they say, how do I change that? Well, you can pray and ask the Lord. Has it changed over the years? No. Then maybe it's time to add fasting to that prayer. Maybe it's time to really get serious and say, God, I want to change. I want you to change me indelibly. I want you to change me. Bring me to the point of no return. I want to be a different person. I want to be able to walk into a room, for instance, and come up to that person that I can't stand and all of a sudden love them. It's not going to happen by your willpower. It's going to happen by a deep and profound spiritual change in your heart. If you have no intention of doing anything more than you've done. By the way, I've noticed this about some people. If you're in this early retirement mode. Because you've already done a lot of things. You've been involved in the church for so many years. If you've determined for yourself that you've done enough. But again, you're going to fulfill the religious obligations. Because it was, it's what the church does at this time of year. Do yourself a favor and don't fast. By the way, for me to say that, and as some of you are thinking about it in your mind, am I on early retirement mode? Yes, you are. People who were once very involved, people who were once energetic, excited about winning the lost, about being involved in what's happening in the kingdom of God, all of a sudden said, well, you know, I, I've served my time. I, I, I've done. You don't finish serving your time. You serve God with every breath that you have from the first to the last. If you're on early retirement mode, don't fast. Please don't fast. Because you're just going to be a grumpy. And I can't deal with grumpy. I'm grumpy enough for all of us. That's why I'm fasting. So maybe the Lord could get a hold of my grump. A fast must lead to spiritual change. 
and not be about fulfilling a religious obligation or religious ritual. That's what's going on with people. That was what was going on with the people of Israel at the time. And it made God sick. There was a pride that was associated with what they were doing. They were so convinced that they were going, that they were, what they were doing was right and they were doing it all right, that God even had to call them out on it. You pretend to want to be around me, he says. You, you pretend that you like me. But really, all you like is the benefits of being around me. But it's really just so you can have my benefits and, and do nothing and have nothing to do with me. That's what he says in verse 2. Well, God, you know, he's a corrector. If God points out something wrong, you definitely know that he's going to point out the right way of doing things. And that's what he does in verse 6. This is the fast that God wants. He says, no, this is the fast that I want. I, I don't need the religious stuff. I don't need you to pretend. If you're going to do it, let's be serious about it. This is the fast that I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. That's justice, by the way. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from your relatives who need help. If all you get, as many others have gotten from these verses, by the way, that this is the proof text that you no longer need to fast, well, I don't know what to tell you. Because that's not at all what the text is saying. He's not saying don't fast. He's saying, but if you are going to fast, you're going to do it the right way. That fasting must lead to real actions and real changes. And he lists out all these different things. Like what? Remove the chains that bind people. Stop oppressing your workers. Make their lo workload lighter. Because that's what the people of Israel were doing. They were fasting. They were living religious. They were living under the blessings and benefit and his protection. And yet there was life as normal. They were no different than the heathen nations around them. Why does he tell them to do all these things? Why does he say this is the type of fast? Because it's not only depriving yourself of food. Which, by the way, that's a fast. You deprive yourself of food. It's none of this no Nintendo stuff. Which we'll get to in a second. But it's denying yourself of a lot of other things. You know that when you come to the aid of someone, you're denying yourself. You know when you give the poor money, what are you doing? You could have bought yourself a cup of coffee with that $3. Instead, you're forgoing the cup of coffee so that person can have a cup of coffee. When you open your doors to someone else, you're forgoing your privacy. You're forgoing your benefits, your luxury, so that someone else can benefit from what you're doing. You see... I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you right now, that's what Christianity really is. It's not about just believing in Jesus and then saying, you know what, we're just going to live our normal life. No, it's about being completely open. It's being like Jesus. He came to serve. We must serve. And I'm going to tell you what, and you're not going to like this, but serving costs something. Giving costs something. Doing costs something. Something. Serving people sometimes is inconvenient, but it's necessary if you're going to be part of the kingdom of God. But you know what I noticed about these words? They were eerily familiar to me. They were written in a different way in Isaiah 61. How many of you are familiar with that? You should be familiar with Isaiah 61. And I'll read a little part of it. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the release to captives and freedom to the prisoners. Doesn't that sound the same so far? To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort those, all those who mourn. Verse 3, to grant to those who mourn in Zion giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the cloak of praise instead of a disheartened spirit, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, planting 
of the Lord that he may be glorified. You know who else said those words? Some of you know. Jesus said those words. 750 some odd years later, Jesus repeated those words. Look, it's found in Luke chapter 4. It says, he, he, what does he do? He walks into the synagogue, the temple, and he opens up the scroll and he begins to read them. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Aren't they exactly the same idea behind Isaiah 58 as what was said in Isaiah 61 and not what Jesus repeats? This is what God requires. This is what God wants. Let me ask you this question. Do you know when Jesus said those words? You're going to be stunned. He just didn't, you know, I love how God orchestrates things and how he structures things. It's not just random things. God is very intentional about how things played out over the course of Jesus' ministry and life. You know when Jesus repeated those words? After he completed a 40-day fast. The 40-day fast where he spent 40 days in the wilderness, and during that 40-day time period, he was tempted by Satan. And look what it says in, verse, uh, in Luke 4, 14 through 15. This is right after Jesus had fasted for 40 days. It says, then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. And reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogues, and it was praised by everyone. I want you to notice something about Jesus coming off a fast. He wasn't all disheveled. The Bible doesn't say he was all disheveled. And, 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 and he didn't go around with this attitude of self-pity. Or he didn't go on a tour of self-pity telling everyone how hard it was. Uh, he didn't go on a self-promotion tour saying, hey, everybody, I just finished doing a 40 days fast. Those are people who have no idea what fasting is all about. I want to tell you another thing about fasting. Fasting is about you understanding that God is your source. It's about understanding that you can go without food. And some of you say, yeah, but that's spiritual. No, you can go without food and God could sustain you for that period of time. You think that there's no biblical precedent for that? Ask Elijah what happened. The angel told him, get up and eat this bread. For 40 days he went on. And was able to minister and do the, 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 and fulfill the ministry that he had because he was being sustained by the power of God. Jesus came out of his fast with the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming freedom to the captives. What does it mean? It means that Jesus went after the fast to fulfill that which God wanted him to do. He got to work doing what God wanted him. One of the many reasons as to why God sent Jesus was to show us how to do things the right way. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed that. I want to be like Jesus. Well, you know, if you want to be like someone, you got to imitate someone. You know, the other day I was watching a documentary, Kobe Bryant. How many of you like Kobe Bryant? I don't even like basketball. I, I'm the type of person that if something catches my attention, it's over, huh? I become a zombie for 45 minutes. And he was talking. And he was saying, you know what? He goes, I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, every morning. And I go through my routine. 360 days a year. I would wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, go to the gym, go do my exercises, stretch, do this, do that, and everything. While my friends would wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and he said, he, I would wake up at 4 and do my exercise, which then I would do my next set of exercises at noon. Then after that, I would do my next set of exercises at 4 or 5, and then I would do my next set of exercises at 9 p.m. He goes, because I was disciplined and able to wake up so many hours earlier, I was able to get in an extra workout section that my friends couldn't. He goes, and you think that's not a big deal, but I've been doing that for years. Then some of my friends said, what's the key to your success? What's the key to your greatness? They said, well, I, I, I train like this, like this, like that. Five, six years into their career, they started to imitate Kobe Bryant, and they started to wake up at four and all that stuff. But you know what Kobe Bryant said? He goes, I've been doing it for so many years that they'll never catch up to me. He goes, by the time I finish my career, they're on their way down anyway. 
Those people were learning from that guy. They said, he must be good for a reason. He must be great because he's doing something right. Let me figure out what he's doing. Well, when it comes to us who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to know what to do? Well, follow the leader. If Jesus went on a fast and came off the fast full of the Holy Spirit, he didn't come back and say, you know what? My first order of business is to go to Uniburger and get myself a double with cheese. His first order of business isn't, you know, he didn't spend the, the 40 days in the wilderness like some of us spend our fasting. Some of the big questions we ask, some of the deep spiritual questions we ask ourselves during the fast. You want to hear it? What's the first place I'm going to when the fast is over? If you had a choice, what would it be? Would it be Greek, Italian, American, Thai, Chinese, whatever? Not Jesus. Jesus came out of the fast full of the Holy Spirit and raring to go. And the first thing that he did was that he fulfilled the, the prophecies of Isaiah. He demonstrated to the people, this is the type of fast that I want. That you loosen the bonds of the people that are bound. That you bring freedom to those that are captive. That you, you, you bring hope to those that are hopeless. That you clothe those that have nothing. That you do the work that I've called you to do. That's God's desire when you you and I fast. It's not about holding out so that we can fulfill our wish list. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why you don't have to worry about your wish list. It's a simple verse found in Matthew. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means his way, his economy. Seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. You don't even have to worry about them because the same way I clothe the lily, the same way I feed the sparrow who are worth nothing compared to you, I feed them, I clothe them, I make sure they're taken care of throughout their lifespan. You better believe that if you commit yourself to doing things the way I want them done, that I will take care of you. Thank hey God. Everyone looks like, oh, well, he's going to take care of us. He's just going to give it. No, listen to what that verse says. He goes, not even the lilies who are clothed in grandeur. He not even Solomon who was clothed. He couldn't even compare to lilies. How God provides is not the way you think. God provides where it counts. You think that God doesn't care about your joy? God doesn't care about our joy or happiness. Oh, no. He sent Jesus. <laughs> to do what? To save us. To show us the true way. To show us how to live, how to be. To give us a promise. To quote the words of Jesus himself. I tell you these things so that what? Your joy may be partially filled, left wanting, without satisfaction. No, so that your joy may be full. I'm going back to the people of Israel. There were a bunch of people that thought they had it all down packed, but they were missing the mark. Again, God sends Jesus to show us even how we are to fast. Fasting is, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this point a little bit hard. Fasting is going without food. It's not about substituting it with whatever you're comfortable with. You see, the notion of you being comfortable with giving something up already eliminates it as a possibility of a fast. I can go 21 days without playing my Xbox. I've already gone nine months. What's another 21 days? By the way, from time to time, I like to unwind by killing fake people. <laughs> Sometimes I name them. No, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's wrong. It's not true. It's not true. Not true. <laughs> it's, not, it's not true. It's not giving up Nintendo. It's not giving up chocolate. It's not giving up Instagram. You can add those. You can say, in addition to 
me covering my mouth for 21 days. I'm not going to play Nintendo. Instead, I'm going to spend that time. I play, well, who plays Nintendo anyway? I mean, Xbox, PlayStation. Oh, okay. One, <laughs> two, PlayStation, whatever. Ladies, whatever it is that you do. I don't know. I know that sounds wrong that I said that because I know girls play video games too. Apparently. I, so I'm told. Whatever it is that you do that consumes your time or that you have dedicated way too much time to, you can add that to your fast. But the fast, the primary point of a fast is to not eat any food. But the fasting that God describes and, and that Jesus demonstrates is fasting from food and fasting from fulfilling all your desires to cause God's desire to be at the forefront. And you know what God wants. Let's not pretend like we don't know what God wants. He wants people to be freed. He wants people to be fed. He wants people to be clothed. He wants people to receive hope. He wants people to receive salvation. Both then and now. If God's people would engage in what God describes, then I want you to take notice of verse 8. Look at the results. Then. I want you to notice the four thens that appear in the rest of the chapter. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Then. When? When you do it right. Then. Some of you, my salvation, well, you're saved, but you'll live in the joy of your salvation. My wounds will be healed. Is it talking about physical wounds? Possibly. But it's talking about wounds in general. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your, your godliness will lead you forward. How many of you want to move forward in your walk? Then your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then, when you call. Pastor, I just feel like when I fast and pray, like God never answers me. I just feel, again, I'm going to ask this question, and this is not to hurt anyone's feelings. Who's the fast about? Is it about you? Or is it about God? Is it about his purposes primarily and first and foremost? Because when they are, then, when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here. And he will quickly reply. I've just been praying about this for years. And years and years and years and years. I still have no clarity. I, I have a, there's this one thing to pray for something to take place over the course of time. And you see advancements. And, but to never hear anything. To never get an indication. To never get some type of relief. There's something wrong in the matrix at that point. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the desert ruins of your city. And then you will be known. And then you will be known as a rebuilder of the walls and restorer of homes. I don't know if you're listening carefully to everything that was said. I know sometimes I have a tendency of going off on tangents and so on, but bear with me for this, 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 this very important point. The fast that counts is a fast that is, is of a yielded person who's yielded completely to the will and purpose of God. The fast that counts is the fast that says, God first, me next. The fast that counts is the fast that is focused on the me part, when it gets to the me part, that me is going to change and that I'm not going to remain the same. The fast that counts is the fast that drops every hypocritical notion from a person's life. Where you're going to do this spiritual discipline, but there's going to be actual change that takes place in your life that affects people around you. You will not be the same. That's the fast that counts. 
then you will be known. First and foremost by God, but then you will walk in your God-given purpose. You will be a restorer. You will be one who brings healing. You will be one that brings That, that brings solace. You are the one that's going to bring comfort. You are the one that's going to bring what people need, which is Jesus Christ. You are going to be known by the people around you. You're not, you know, there's, I don't want to be a hypocrite. How many of you want to be a hypocrite? How many of you want to be known as a hypocrite? None, none. So let's just do it right. Let's walk into this fast a little bit different. Let's walk into this fast saying, Lord, I want this. I want these. If I'm not going to go without food, if I'm not going to go with my favorite things for an extended period of time, if I'm going to deprive myself of these things, well, then I want it to count. God, change me. Change me so that I can be a positive, of positive impact to those around me. Change me so that I'm ready to receive that which you have prepared and that which is coming. Change me so that I can be, I can be given more responsibilities, greater responsibilities. Change me so that I could be an example of what it is to be a follower and disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Change me because I don't want to be the same. You know, there's some people that feel that they're in a spiritual rut, and you are. You know, people like to say that thing, the, 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 what was the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and expecting a different outcome. That's not really the definition of insanity, by the way. But it's a, it's, it's a pretty good example of what it can be. You feel that you're stuck in a spiritual rut? Well, then change whatever it is you're doing. Or change how it is that you're doing it. Because I'm telling you right now, when we line up with what God wants, the resultant is far greater than you can imagine. As a matter of fact, whatever you've hoped and imagined would be settling in comparison to what God has in store for you throughout this time of fasting and throughout this next year that's ahead of us. That's the type of fast that counts. And I don't know about you, but I don't like wasting time because time is a very precious commodity. You can never bank it. You can never store it. You can never redeem it. You can never complain. Uh, you, you can never stock it up or do anything like that. You have to spend it as you go. And I don't like wasting one second. And so when we go through this next 21 days of fasting, I hope you're like me and you don't want to waste a moment. But you want to dive right in and you say, God, I mean business with you this time around. I know I've done this before and there have been some benefits. There have been some changes. But I'm all in this year. And I'll tell you why you should be all in this year. Because 2024, there's stuff a-brewing. And I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm not into scaring you. As a matter of fact, you know me. I'm into preparing you because I believe that you are sealed by the precious blood of Jesus. And as I mentioned last week, you're overcomers. And if you commit yourself to doing things God's way, you're going to see that you are going to walk out of 2024 and if God allows us to go into 2025 with a very high and powerful hand. And you're going to look back after the year and you're going to say, you know what? I never saw this coming. I could have never imagined this. Now I'm going to close with these last couple of verses in Isaiah 58. And this I'm going to throw in for free. This has nothing to do with the fast. But somehow, God put it there. The last couple of verses. Are you ready for this one? Yes. Keep the Sabbath holy. <laughs> yeah, but I'm a New Testament believer. My Sabbath is in Jesus. Yes, you're absolutely right. Your Sabbath rest is in Christ. Keep the Sabbath holy. <laughs> Don't pursue your own interests on that day. But enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires and talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight and I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the, entrance, the inheritance that I promised to you, your ancestors, Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. I know we uh, don't celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday. 
I know that we come to church on Sunday. I know that we're not bound by the law of Moses in that sense. And I know that the Sabbath, our Sabbath rest is in Christ Jesus. But there is a time when we come together that we set apart in the whole week. You, are you listening to me? I'm being as literal as I can possibly be. I'm, I'll be very literal. Sunday is the Lord's day. Sunday is the time when the saints come together. And it's not legalistic. It's about you and I being together in fellowship in the presence of God. Look at Psalm 92. This is the, the theme chapter of our fast because we've named this fast Planted. You can't grow if you're not planted. You can't get nutrients if you're not planted. Verse 13, it says, For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in their old age. It doesn't mean that when you get old. It's starting from now. The moment that you plant yourself... And even in your old age that you will still produce fruit and will remain vital and green. They will declare the Lord is just. He is my rock. There is no evil in him. What I mean to say by all this is do not make your Sunday worship or make your Sunday worship and your attendance. And no, I want to say something. You just want people in the church so that they give in the offering. No, we give electronically now. People give, they don't even show up. I don't want your money. God doesn't want your money. God's not interested in that. What he wants is you. He wants your effort. Make your worship on Sunday a non-negotiable. Make your efforts to attend And make the house of God your priority. Don't make justifications. Don't make excuses for not being in the house of God. If you're into that, if, if, if your absence is okay, listen, I'm not against vacation. Go on vacation. Enjoy. You need a break. Some of you, like today, you need a vacation. <laughs> you should sign up and go. Go lie down somewhere and get up when you feel okay. Okay? Go on vacation. I say, well, you're saying never miss. No, even when you're on vacation, go to church. Even when you're far away, find a place to worship. Don't sit in your little hotel room and say, no, oh, you know what? There's no church. I'm just going to watch online. Go. There's nothing that substitutes you being in the physical presence of other believers that love God and worship. As a matter of fact, you get encouraged and built up. You become vibrant. So don't, don't justify absence. Oh, Pastor, you're, you're, so, you're so legalistic. Yes, praise God. <laughs> What do you want me to say? But value the house of God. It's not just valuing a, it's not valuing a building. It's valuing the people that you're around. I want to tell you another thing. This has been hitting me hard the past little while. If you make church optional, your kids will make church optional. You make church optional, your grandkids will take it optional. Your, your grandkids won't even come anymore. Why? Oh, no, it's just because they have to make their own choices. No, because they watched you. They saw that it wasn't important to you. And so if it wasn't important to you, it's definitely not going to be important to them. Make it happen. Be in the house of God so that you will be planted, so that you will be rooted, so that you will receive from God by being in the household of faith, by being with other people that love and worship God. I promise you, you will see the results of that.